I always feel weird saying it, but that was the most important decision I made in my entire life was to uh, open up to swinging. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 168. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have an interview with Cooper of Life on the Swing Set fame. The other two co-hosts... Which is a podcast. Right, I was going to say, which is it's a one podcast. It's one of the OG podcasts from... started way back in 2010... And we talk about this with Cooper, actually, is right at the beginning of our journey of starting to explore non-monogamy. So we listened from, like, day one and, till, and t- keep listening at times till uh, now. Right? So. <laughs> it's been a long journey. We have had the other hosts of Life on the Swing Set, Ginger and Dylan, on the show previously. Links to their episodes are going to be in the show notes. But this interview, we dive into Cooper's story specifically, and we really focus a lot on his the beginning first years of his journey. And then we kind of wrap up a 10 years in the next half of the episode. And it's it's, ama- it's an amazing story. And it's really fun to talk to him. Yeah, of course. And so thank thank you, Cooper, for coming on. We've been trying to make it happen for a while. And we're, we're happy we finally uh, were able to do it. And, you know, a couple other things like we've we've known Cooper since about 2015. We met him at a, at a conference out in Washington, D.C. Yep. And have kind of kept in touch. And we've been on a handful of his uh, desire or handful of the life on the swing set. Desire Takeover Trips, which are uh, supposed to be happening again in November this year. So take a look in the show notes. There's links uh, for that. That's one of the best trips we've ever been on in our entire lives. I'm not sure we're going to make it this year, but either way, you should definitely check it out and probably go yourself if you're looking for a way to get out um, and, and meet some other amazing people. Yes. And- All right. Sorry. I just went on a rambly talk here. So. <laughs> it's all good. A few quick announcements. First up. Our next virtual meet and greet is this coming Saturday, February 20th at 6 p.m. Pacific or 9 p.m. Eastern. If you haven't attended a virtual meet and greet before, you should definitely check it out. These are events where we bring everyone into together into a Zoom room. We talk and do some icebreaker questions, and then we send you out into breakout rooms where you get to meet and talk with smaller groups of people, usually three to four other people people or couples who join the call and we give you a talking point and question that are they're really fun and random questions and then you come back we scramble the rooms and you go back out and try again and not try again no, you try you again get, you get to you, you get, get another to, shot you get, you get to another shot at it you get to do it again <laughs> with other people and so it's we've had a blast doing these they've been growing every month and so please come join us check it out this saturday February 20th. If you want to sign up, it's only $10. They're open to everyone. Uh, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com and click on the meet and greet tab. Yeah, it's just like going to Desire. Oh, yeah. Life on the swing set, oh, but yeah. <laughs> it just costs $4,990 less. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you can even set your Zoom background to be a beach. Why not? And yeah, it's a great way to meet people and we've, we've been having fun. So we hope to see you there and uh, we'll see you on Saturday. Yes. One other quick thing we wanted to touch on before we jump into the interview with Cooper is uh, the last few weeks you've probably seen on Fridays, we've been putting out the Power of Witness series, which is a group coaching um, sessions or group coaching cohort we did with Catherine of Expansive Connection. She's been on the show a few times and um, it has been amazing. It it was hugely impactful for both Emma and myself. And uh, the series is over now, but uh, she does have actual um, cohorts and programs open for anybody who wants to join. They're not part of our show at this point, but if you do use the links in the show notes, we get a couple of bucks uh, for sending you her way. And they are, uh, there is one in March coming up that is got spots open. And so, yes, if it's something that you listened to and thought that it might be impactful for you, we'd urge you to go check it out and and think about signing up. Yes. There's a few spots left in her early March group, and you'd also get a discount by using the links on our page. So go do that. That'd be awesome. Join. It's going to be amazing. I mean, just 
from the experience we had, we can only imagine how amazing this uh, the next group will be. Yeah, we're, we're really excited about it. And again, it was impactful for Emma and myself, and we, we didn't even really go through it. So going through it um, in full is just, you know, super powerful. So, yeah. And if you missed the six episodes for Power Witness Series, go back in your podcast player and listen. Please check them out. And we'd love to hear what you think of them too. We'd love to hear feedback. So reach out to us, normalizingnonmonogamy.com and click on the contact page and send us an email or voicemail and let us know what you think. About anything, really. Well, yeah, of course. But specifically, we'd also like to hear feedback about the Power of Witness. And if you would like to come on the show, we'd love to have you. Uh, I know today's guest is a, is a podcaster. You don't have to be a podcaster. You could just be any old person or young person. Who, <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> who's been or is thinking about exploring non-monogamy or has non-monogamy vibes going on. So we're, we just love hearing from everybody. And if you think uh, you'd love to come on and share your story, we'd love to have it. So again... Head over to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the Contact Us page and either send us an email or a voicemail, and uh, we'll be in touch. And let's go talk to Cooper. All right. We're live on tape from the... Live on tape. From our bedroom. (laughs) From our bedroom. (laughs) Yeah, at first glance at your your thumbnail, it looked like desire, and it's like, whoa, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, we live here now. (laughs) Yeah, we decided. What's happening? (laughs) Yeah. We figured four hundred dollars a night was sustainable. So oh yeah, we, no, we sure. just moved in. Sure. <laughs> it's almost that much. Yeah, wow, well, yeah, no shit, Southern California, not much better. <laughs> All right, well, welcome to the show, Cooper. We've we've had Thank every you. other uh, OG from Life on the Swing set, <laughs> save for I think was it Kylie. Oh, Kylie, you know, so, yeah. So that's that's the only one we've never had. But I, I think you know so. what well, we're. I can full. give I can give you her contact info if you'd like. Well, that that would be the full set. <laughs> it's like Pokemon. You got to collect them all. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for being here for joining us and and uh, welcome. Well, it's my pleasure. Yeah. yeah, we're super excited to have you here. And I have we- been very impressed by you two. By the way, I Aww. I need, I feel like I need to say this, like you guys popped up as a podcast and then immediately just like you were spreading like all over the place it's like well oh my god they're there and oh look at this they're on here and i i have been so impressed and you guys are doing a phenomenal job i'm i'm really impressed well, well thank you that's thank very you. kind yeah we we have a huge team uh, over <laughs> just, here at nnm headquarters I'm, I'm looking at i'm looking <laughs> yeah. at that team yeah <laughs> But thank you. That's that's amazing to hear <laughs> yes. from from you know for anybody who doesn't know Cooper, maybe introduce yourself. Real and, quick, I oh, have to no, say, no? Okay. Yes. I'm going to have you let you introduce yourself before you do that. Your your your. Did show. you just say I'm a I'm a let you introduce? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Show's well, going to well. let you. Sure. <laughs> but before I let you do that, um, <laughs> I, I wanted to say that life on the swing set was. It just got to give you some credit, too, because that was very fundamental in our journey. Yeah. And, like, we found you guys in 2010, right when you started. 2010? Right at the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Like, right. That was we, that we, was the beginning of our lifestyle journey. Oh, my God. And we found you at the same time. So we, we kind of grew with you. Aww. Yeah. We, gradu- we graduated college. I moved to Washington, D.C. area. Emma went to Africa for, like, four months. Mm-hmm. And when she came back, I was like into it. Yeah. And she like, check and, out this and, podcast. And we started listening together. And I just yeah, my <laughs> my earliest memories of listening to your show was standing in our very Kitchen. first apartment that we ever rented together. We so. would we would make dinner wow. and listen to your show. <laughs> oh, that's so, awesome. That's so awesome. we go way back. Yeah. We've been in a long term yeah. relationship and you didn't even know it. <laughs> I didn't. I'm I'm happy about that. <laughs> well now, Emma, would you let him introduce yeah. himself? <laughs> Can you- can you please introduce yourself now that I interrupted you? Sure. Um, well, in 2010, uh, I, along with Dylan Thomas, started the Life on the Swing Set podcast. Um, basically, after I think it was nine months of swinging, I felt like I got it yeah, enough yeah. Yeah. that I could podcast about it and tell other people what they're doing wrong. And I've allowed that hubris to pretty much guide all my decisions ever <laughs> since in, yeah. in terms of telling people that they're fucking it up <laughs> and here's how you should do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like we waited about 11 years too long to start our show. <laughs> well, no, you're, you're far more competent. See, that's, that's the thing. And we don't give anybody advice. We let, uh, we let our guests do that. And then when people write in and tell us we gave bad advice, we said, hey, that wasn't our advice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you this remember our is- early disclaimer that our our uh, all opinions are our own and our advice is for novelty purposes only, I believe. Yes, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Well, yeah, so we're super excited to have you on and and hear the the backstory of Cooper for anybody who maybe hasn't hasn't heard it from the beginning kind of as we have. So Yeah. Maybe take us back to those those nine months before you and Dylan decided to, to <laughs> The early splash days. The early days. Um well it's it's funny. I I listened to a podcast called Halloweenies. And they're doing the Friday the 13th series right now. And Friday the 13th remake holds a very special place in my heart because I saw that the night my ex and I soft swapped for the first time. We we went to see that that movie (laughs) and then we came home and we fooled around with another couple for the very first time. Uh, so I will always remember February 14, 13th, it was the 13th, February 13th, 2009, for that very reason. It's it's really funny looking back on how, how long ago it was and how it informed everything. You know, I I always feel weird saying it, but that was the most important decision I made in my entire life was to... Uh, open up to swinging, and it's it's changed everything. Like every facet of my life is is here because of that one decision way back then. Like my my current partner, I met her because of life on the swing set. Uh, so she wouldn't be in my life without <laughs> the right. swing set, which wouldn't be in my life without that one. Hey, well, let's try swinging. There's always swinging. I mean, it it. It's fascinating to me because I always felt weird that I would say I could never not do this. You know, I could never close up again. Right. And every you know, you know how swingers posture often. <laughs> it's just like, no, no, no. This is just a fun thing we do on the side. You know, the best sex I'll ever have is with my partner. I don't need swinging. Yeah, yeah. So I've I've never uh, I've never gone in with that bullshit. Um, well, what was what was I don't your know motivation? Where I was going with that. Yeah, what no, was no, the motiva- it's all good. What was your motivation for you and and your wife at that <laughs> divorce? Time? <laughs> no, no. Seriously, uh, we we both um, had a very strict Catholic upbringing. We were both dorks. Uh, who didn't get any in high school. Um, we got together almost immediately after high school and we got married, you know, from there. So we, we had never really explored sexually with anyone else. And, you know, we were, I think we were seven years into our marriage, uh, when we opened up to swinging and it, it, came from the fact that we both wanted to fuck other people and we were both too scared to tell each other that. And so we were both seeing a relationship uh, therapist who was the same relationship therapist. And she kept trying to nudge us in the right direction. Like you should really talk to each other about it. But we figured, Oh, well, she's just saying that because that's what you say to, to you should talk to your partner. You know, and I wish she just said, look, you both want the same thing. Will you please talk to each other about it? Because we got all the way to, uh, you know, I guess that means we get divorced because we we want to fuck other people. Because what else do you do? You know, that's that's it. It's it's that or let's take a break. And you know how that always works. <laughs> so randomly at a dinner, we were talking about how we didn't want to get divorced. And I said, well, there's always swinging. And we we had a good laugh. <laughs> and then we thought, well, I mean, if we're already heading towards divorce. What's the worst that happens? You yeah, get what is it that we get divorced? So really, that's, I mean, it seems like a no-brainer. And one of the reasons I started Life on the Swing Set was because I got so pissed off by how many people tell you your relationship needs to be perfect going into swinging. You need to have a strong center 
to get into swinging. But no one's relationship is perfect. And everybody who tells you your relationship needs to be perfect is lying because theirs wasn't perfect. And you you have to... Um, I mean, if if the thing wrong with your relationship is wanting to fuck other people, really, there is no better solution right. than swinging right. to, to fix your relationship. Right, right. Yeah. If that's something you both want. Yeah. yeah that and the, and the notion that you can only open your relationship if you're having sex at least twice oh, a day. Yeah, right. Right. But between the two of you, then then you're a lot that unlocks the next level, which is swinging, right? it yeah. feels it feels like you have to, you know, you're constantly having to prove yourself to be in the swinger community. It's a lot like the LGBT community and whether whether or not, oh, am I queer enough? Can I use the word queer? You know, is that okay if if I use the word queer because I might not be as queer as you uh, it's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, we actually we recently had a guest on who said that that she um, they actually they write a blog called Polly in Place. And she said that she was on a date with a woman her first time going on a date with a woman. And she felt really worried that she wasn't, you know, actually bisexual or she wasn't bisexual enough to even be on a date with another woman. And I think yeah. that's a you know, that's a really hard place to be. It's not something that I've uh, gone through, but I like. I feel for that, right? That's that's tough. Mm -hmm. Well, we live in fear of not being good enough, and that yeah. goes for every aspect of our lives. And so when it comes to making a huge decision like opening your your marriage, right. that's that's enormous. Most people never make decisions that are that big aside from maybe let's have kids. That's that one's right up there in the marriage altering spectrum, I think. Yeah. For sure. And it's it, to feel like you're not good enough. That's that's so shitty, and that's why we really wanted to emphasize that this is a welcoming hand. This is we are giving you the question, not the answer. And the question is: Do I want to be monogamous or do I want to be uh, non-monogamous? That is the question. Right. Mm -hmm. And whichever way you go, that's that's awesome. You made a decision. You made the choice. Right. 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 So, yeah. so when you and your wife had this discussion and you had a laugh over dinner, <laughs> yes. How? What happens after dinner? What? What? Okay. Yeah. What so, goes on from there? So, uh, <laughs> the reason uh, the reason I had swinging on my mind in the first place is because I was um, I had a portrait studio at the time and I was doing boudoir photography and a very old friend of mine, my, my first girlfriend, if you want to actually go along with the, I had a girlfriend at, in, in sixth grade, <laughs> she was looking at my portfolio and she, she casually threw off. So you're, you're in the lifestyle, right? And I had no idea what that meant, but it sounded interesting. You know, it's <laughs> it one of those things that pings. It's like, no, but I want to know more. <laughs> <laughs> and so she basically told me that, you know, well, the swinging lifestyle. And it's like, wait a minute, swinging is still a thing? I didn't think people did that anymore. And so she showed me this video. Um, uh, it's been so long now since I've seen this. But it was it was like your friendly neighborhood swingers or something. It was done like a 1950s self-help video. It was hilarious and it was friendly. And it wasn't scary. And that was amazing. So that's what led to my, well, there's always swinging. And that web, that that video recommended Lifestyle Lounge. So after we come up with this, well, there's always swinging, I thought, well, okay, let's put some real uh, research in here and let's sign up for Lifestyle Lounge. And we got messaged by a couple within the day we put that up and... We went back and forth. We did the thing, you know, like, oh, yeah, well, maybe we'll get together. And they're like, no, we'll get together Sunday. <laughs> we will. We're going to get together Sunday. And it's like, I, I don't know if Sunday. No, it's going to be fine. You will get That's together church. Sunday. That's the day we go to church. <laughs> <laughs> so we got together Sunday. So this just is less than a right week in. after. Yeah. And uh, that first date, we just met. We just hung out. And then, yeah, you know, after we after we left uh, that date, we got a message from them. So let's get together next week. <laughs> and I believe the reason for the Friday the Thirteenth thing is because I was planning on seeing it, and I wanted to see it, and I was still afraid of committing to this. <laughs> so I said, "Well, why don't we go see a movie first, and then see where we're at?" Yeah, and that's that's it. Literally, it was like a two week turnaround, and it changed everything. Like it, it everything was different. 
Yeah. 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 Leading up to that first, even that first night where you just went and met him for dinner or whatever, had you and, and your wife like talked through like, what are, what are we doing? Were you scared? Like, what were you both feeling going into that first night? We were weirdly excited. And I think it was a lot to do with the fact that we hadn't had a lot to be excited about for a while, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I'm pretty sure we had sex more than we had in the, in the six months that preceded it in that first week. And, and it was, it was, we weren't really afraid because we had no idea what was happening. We had no idea what, what it would be like. We knew we were getting together for f food and drinks and that's it. We knew that. So, but, but even still, it was like, you know, we're getting ready for this thing. And I couldn't remember the last time I'd been on a first date, you know, and it was yeah. just so odd preparing you know looking looking good but looking good for other people not looking good for each other because that's fine that's one thing but looking good for other people requires a whole lot of extra information to process right and yeah i i don't remember it being scary in a negative way it was just scary in a we're really doing this, aren't we? This is this is like a thing that's actually happening. But it is a damn good thing that we were basically bullied into our first date because <laughs> we probably would have sat around on that website for six months and made almost plans. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. You needed that little push. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you go to you go to see Friday the Thirteenth. <laughs> yes. You have your you have your first soft swap. What what goes? What happens? What happens after that between? between well, because apparently, approximately nine months later, you are ready to start a podcast. Right. Well, so, I mean, you no, kept so, going. <laughs> so what's really funny here is is uh, to give you an example of how my life changed. So I was blogging as uh, you know for a long time leading up to here, and at that moment, I didn't know what else to blog about because nothing seemed as important anymore. You know, all the little bullshit I used to blog about wasn't important. And so we we were we immediately met another couple the that that Sunday after that date um because we were not paying attention to any sort of uh you know we we waited for this kind of sexy time for a long time <laughs> so now like it's available to us let's go for it so i just stopped everything else in in uh all my other weird little goofy outlets in my life. And I started making notes about what was happening in our life and, and our relationship. And about six months in, I wrote a screenplay about swinging. Again, see, I, I feel like I understand things very quickly. <laughs> um, that screenplay actually became uh, my, my book, A Lifeless Monogamous, a decade later. But it was... It was about trying to figure out who we were now, because there was a very distinct before swinging period and a very distinct after swinging period. You know, it it was a, a major dividing line. And, and the day after, actually, uh, so I was a wedding photographer way back then, and I was shooting a wedding the day after this. And so I'm constantly texting uh, my ex to see if she's okay. You know, that she's still happy with our decision. I'm dealing with the weird euphoria that comes from a brand new experience like that. My father at one point calls me on the phone and said, did you have fun last night? And I panicked because I had no idea what he was talking about, but he couldn't possibly <laughs> be talking about that. No, he was just talking about the movie that I'd been talking about on Facebook all week that I was going to go see. Yeah, that was, did you have fun seeing Friday the 13th? Not, did you have fun uh, having sex with other people? You need to teach him about communication. Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I did that, then my parents wouldn't leave the voicemail that says, hey, I need to talk to you about something. Call me. Yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah. It's the worst fucking voicemail ever. Yeah. Yep. I got one. I got one about two weeks ago from my dad in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> can you can you talk for a minute? Oh, no. And I'm like, Jesus. And I call him. He's like, hey, I bought that steak you were talking about, and I wanted to make sure I knew how to cook it right. <laughs> 
And I'm over here like sweating. Yeah. <laughs> Emma's having a panic attack. We like, figured, what's going we on? Somebody what, died. what did they learn? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So we we hear you on that. So. <laughs> yeah. So you. So you. Sorry, I didn't mean to go on a tangent there. So you're at your <laughs> wedding. You're at the wedding, and you and your ex wife are kind of reliving the whole thing via text uh-huh. message. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we discovered Swingtown, which it's so depressing that didn't get more than half a season. Because that was on Netflix right there. And it was like, it was perfect. Because also, at the beginning of Swingtown, first, it takes place in Chicago. And we're from Chicago. But second, it ta- uh, they, they, they reference Schomburg, which is the town we lived in at the time in the first episode. And it's just like, well, okay, see, everything's coming together here. It's just, <laughs> this is clearly what we needed to be doing. This yeah. is meant to be. <laughs> meant to be, yes. Yeah. So I guess so you wrote the screenplay and yes. and had all these experiences. Well, and it sounds like pedal to the metal, right? You said like yeah. we oh, yeah. met that yeah. we met that couple. We went the next week to met another couple, and was the you were just full, we did we did on. soft swap with a few couples, and then we were invited to a party that went spe- no no this this was a different party. We were invited to a party uh, where we met the couple we would ultimately first full swap with and that was very cool and that was the party um where i really recognized what it was that was so valuable about this and you know it's 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 the sex yeah it's awesome but really it's about touch and close interaction with other people and yeah that's sex but that's also just being able to to touch the person you're talking to and we try so hard not to do that in the real world because people might misinterpret what you're doing, you know, because everything is in the front of the relationship they have. If, if you, and when you remove that uh, sexual barrier from your communication, it's really easy to talk about anything then, you know, and that, that party, I was having a conversation with one of the one of the couples that we were we were spending time with, and a friend of theirs, and the friend was telling a story, and she leaned forward and put her hand on my knee, and I that was the moment where it just all clicked for me because it was like this is this is it, this is what I'm not missing because I never had it, mm-hmm. you know this is what I want this closeness is what I want and need. And um, and it really, you know, we we may have gone full throttle into swinging, but we didn't, we were very lucky in that we met a group of people very early mm-hmm. who were all friends with each other. So they were having parties, they were hanging out a lot. And um, we got to see the version of swinging that, emphasizes friendship and relationships we never really had the version that's more hookups and one night things we didn't do that and so we were we were kind of doing poly light at the very beginning you know it 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 all cohesed into place there right and you know the ultimately when we when i look back on the first couple we were with he was a toxic monster but i didn't realize it then right and that's good because had i realized it then we may not have ever progressed right Right. but he he like specifically told his uh girlfriend that she was not allowed to have an orgasm with me and was not allowed to tell me that she was not allowed to have an orgasm with me so like, he's over there really, really pleasing my wife, and I can't seem to get anywhere with his partner. You know, it, yeah. There was there was a lot of mind games bullshit there. Yeah. yeah. Right. But you didn't know it at the time. Yeah. But yeah. I didn't know it. Yeah. I right. and thankfully we we progressed past them quickly. You know, we we moved into this group and it was it was wonderful there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was curious, so, I mean, for anybody who was paying attention at all, you've referred to her as your ex-wife. So, so the, the spoiler there is that you're no longer married, right? <laughs> Spoilers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, for a while, did this 
bring you two together and yes. enhance your relationship? Yes, without question. We we were together four and a half years after we started swigging, and we probably would have been together maybe another six months had we not. Okay. So regardless of how it ended, and it didn't end terribly, you know, it ended as amicably as divorces can go, really. Mm-hmm. But... um Swinging extended our our relationship, and swinging gave us so much, and changed us both so much, and gave us the wonderful perk of having someone there to help you through your divorce. Right, right, because right, you had community and you had yeah. friendships and deep friendships. So, uh, you know the the thing about um, the thing everybody asks is. Did you divorce because of swinging? And no, we did not divorce because of swinging. What swinging did was it hid some of the problems for a while. Mm-hmm. You know, and there were there are always fundamental issues that you have. And the question is, how well can you work through those issues? And fundamental issues like money or time or, you know... It, things you enjoy, those things aren't going to go away just because you find a new thing you enjoy. It just distracts you for a long time. So we were distracted for four and a half years, and that's a wonderful long time. And then we weren't distracted anymore. And we saw the problems, and we realized that was it. We can't continue to do that. And so uh, we, we got divorced, and you know what? I'm still 100% happy with the idea, with with the choices that we made up until that point. And it really caused me to reflect on impermanence and how relationships don't need to last until you die to be successful. You know, there was, there were great things that came out of my relationship and there were great lessons I learned from my relationship. Um, And I can take those to every other relationship I have. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's hugely important, and thank you for sharing. And I know, you know, one of the things that people often say is, well, if you have a bad relationship at the core, swinging will expose that. And it's. Mm-hmm. A, I think this might be one of the first times where we've heard somebody say that swinging actually camouflaged some mm-hmm. of that um, because it sounds like the problems that you were having weren't Problems that would be magnified by swinging necessarily. Right. It, they were they were problems that were on like the complete opposite side of the the relationship sphere, so to speak. And so yeah. they were they were easy to push down and let the excitement kind of overshadow them. Well, I think the reason everybody says that about swinging is because swinging forces communication, mm-hmm. and if you're not good at communication, communication can go very badly. And if you don't improve at communication, yeah, it could end your relationship. Right. You know, no, it, sure. it really doesn't matter the the fundamental issue there. But if you're if you're like money problems is not a communication issue, you know, no matter how you talk about it, it's still a problem. Mm-hmm. So therefore, you know, that yeah, but but it's it's exactly that. And I do uh understand why people say that, and I realize I am probably an outlier in the swinging solving a relationship problem uh, category. And I would never recommend that people use swinging to resolve their relationship problems. But I also, and the reason I started a podcast, the reason we started Life on the Swing Set was to to be willing to say the things that swingers weren't willing to say. And the those things are like, you can have issues Mm-hmm. That's okay. We all have issues. There is no perfect relationship. Therefore, we all have to figure out how to work our issues as we move through non-monogamy. And it it can help because if it makes you a better communicator, it can help solve other problems mm-hmm. that yeah. are communication-based, you know, because we all have communication problems. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, one of my I don't know if I've explicitly said this, but I think some of my favorite stories that we've heard on this show are ones where they the, the couple has gotten into swinging or even polyamory, um, largely in part due to an infidelity. Mm-hmm. And I think those, to me, show like uh, the ultimate ability to communicate 
through something very difficult and the resilience that comes through that and that you can take an infidelity and then turn it into something that most people could never even imagine like i don't know i just like you're almost laughing in the face of the thing that tears so many relationships apart and i think i i love that aspect Mm -hmm. of it and i yeah I always cheer for that one. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's put it's pushing against that norm too. Yeah. That mm-hmm. everyone th- assumes that an infidelity means the end of a relationship, and it doesn't always. Yeah. yeah. A lot of it is about growth. Mm-hmm. You know, when when we are monogamous, it's very easy to see yourself as no longer growing, and if you're no longer growing, you don't try to grow either. And so when when something catastrophic affects your relationship, like um, like an infidelity uh, experience, you have a choice. Mm-hmm. You can grow, and it, it will be hard, or you can remain static. And that static part is the one that says, I can never forgive you ever because I would never do such a thing because we all know ourselves so well. And it it is a, an inflexibility, and that's not to make it seem like everybody who ever uh, got divorced because of infidelity was horrible or inflexible. It's just they probably also never had the conversation with anyone that there is a possible future after infidelity. Right. You know, TV told me that I have to get divorced if I want to fuck other people. Yeah. So yeah. what on earth would infidelity have told me? You know, it, it's yeah. it's real easy to fall into the pitfalls that society has set up for us. Mm-hmm. Right. And non-monogamy is just we we've wiped the slate clean over here, and we're we're trying something that's completely off the map. You know, it's right. yeah. here be dragons like in the old uh, <laughs> pirate maps. Yeah. yeah, and for sure, you know, I just want to maybe clarify for anybody listening that like. I'm not saying that every infidelity can or should be solved oh, with, no. with swinging or oh, polyamory, no, no. but but that if you if you do face this, that when people do take that look and say that there is another option and that it worked for them, I that's sort yeah. of where I was going with that. Mm-hmm. Just so anybody didn't take that out of context. <laughs> it's a good so, disclaimer. Sometimes yeah. I like to cover my own ass. <laughs> I've learned from you, Cooper. Yes. Yeah. Well, it saves you from the angry emails. <laughs> well, at least we try to yeah. save ourselves from the angry emails. <laughs> well, you'll never do that entirely. No. I know. I no. know. That's part of it out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So you, you and your ex-wife, you, you, you're progressing through. You've, you've full swapped. You've moved away from the couple who was super toxic, or at least the guy who was super toxic, and you've really found this community of. Really, this friends with benefits, this sort of poly adjacent, poly light mm-hmm. type thing. How how do you two move forward at this point? Or maybe at this point, you are not you two anymore. You're you're no. We solo. were we started exploring actual poly when uh, when we met a unicorn. Um, and we stumbled into that. We were not hunting. We just randomly came across one Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh it's it was it was really a question of well we're we're already really really close with these people that we hang out with and we care very much about them so at what point is there a difference between romantic love and friend love you know in in monogamy there's very clear lines but in non-monogamy there isn't unless you're forcing yourself to have those lines you know because there's nothing wrong with with uh, excluding romantic interest from your non-monogamy there's nothing wrong with that but you have to make that choice you have to put those lines in place because there's every chance you're going to meet someone who will ping that relationship draw for you and the question then becomes how do you deal with that because that could be a problem and in Tristan Terramino's opening up she said that's where you decide whether to evolve or not right and if if you evolve 
And if evolution is not swinging to poly, that's not evolution. Evolution is changing with new information. Mm -hmm. And so we discovered that we were having stronger feelings for some people, and they were having stronger feelings for us. And Shira B. Katz, our polyamorous queen, was on the podcast at this point. And so we stopped being afraid of it. Because at the beginning, we were really afraid of it. You know, sex is easy. Mm -hmm. Once you can turn off that connection between sex and love, like all sex has to have love, once you can flip that switch, sex is really easy. It's more difficult when you include the love part because then you have these weird areas to navigate. And poly is hard. It's really, really hard. And you you don't, uh, you know, it doesn't get easier. You just get better at it. And that's, that's the, the hardest thing about it is you're constantly finding new and surprising things in Polly that you don't know how to deal with. And that's when all these friends that you have, this network of community that you have is so valuable because someone who's been through similar things can give you far better advice most of the time than an uh, academically minded therapist who has never experienced non-monogamy and is reasonably likely to attribute all your problems to non-monogamy. Right. Right. So we had, we had started poly. We had uh, relationships the, with people we were close to, and that's about where it, where we started to fall apart. Um, and, I was very lucky that uh, my uh, my current partner, uh, L came into my life right at the tail end of my marriage, and so was able to be there through uh, through all of it, and that really made a difference for me. And, you know, the divorces are hard. That's just the way it is, and... Um, regrowth afterwards. You know, I'm very different now than I was when I got divorced simply because my current style of non-monogamy really emphasizes uh, queer relationships that I have. Uh, my my connection to the LGBT community, community here in uh, Chicago. And that's a very different aspect of, of non-monogamy than it was before. Because, like, when I would throw swinger parties, who turns up to a swinger party? Well, hetero couples who have bisexuality sprinkled in there mm -hmm. and unicorns. That's who turns up to a swinger party, but mostly couples. But who turns up to a queer sex party? Well, anybody. Anybody who's interested in exploration and growth and sexual experimentation, that's who comes to those parties. And that's been so... Um, gratifying because we've been able to meet such variety of people and, and explore different kinds of relationships with different people. And that's really what I wanted, what I've been trying forever to turn the swing set takes desire our our yearly, well, yearly, except for this year, this, well, except for 2020, because we're in 2021 now, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. We're, we're living except in the Except for era. 2020. Uh, <laughs> That foul year. Uh, we, we've we really tried to make that a queer safe space because really there aren't major queer safe spaces in most venues for swinging. You know, there's a lot of that, uh, okay, well, guys can do whatever they want behind closed doors. It's like, oh, great. Thanks for the permission. You would never have known I was doing something behind closed doors. So thank you for telling me I can. <laughs> <laughs> but to be to be in a community where like i identify as queer but i mainly am a bisexual male and bi guys are very 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 looked down upon in the greater swinger community it's changing but it's not changing a lot it's changing in pockets and that's really one thing that i've definitely learned is i have insulated myself from the swinger community at large by building my own community. And I should have known that. I should have known that if I invite people to be part of a community, 
they're probably going to be responsive and reflective of the people I like to be around. Whereas you look at the greater swinger community, and this is where I get controversial and difficult, so you can tell your listeners to send their hate mail to me. By and large, these are uh, tourists in sexual exploration. They're not part of a community. They dip their toes in and out. You know, it's something they do on the weekends for an hour. Well, not an hour, like five hours. <laughs> but they don't do... It's not who they are. It's not part of their identity. The thing that boggled my mind was how much pushback... So I was at Naughty in New Orleans in, in 2019. And I did a, a, sem, a session on... Um, male bisexuality, and I was shocked by how much pushback I got from the suggestion that most swingers are part of the LGBT community. And and they were like, no, we're not. It's like, well, what do you think the B stands for? That's bisexual. And did your wife eat any pussy last night? Because if she did, she's probably at least a little bisexual, which means you're at least a little bit a part of this community. And by pretending you're not, that indicates tourist. If if you refuse to acknowledge that, and this is this is not a you need to do things my way. This is literally you are part of this community, whether you want to admit it or not. But by not admitting it, you're hurting this community. Because by not admitting it, you have created a division. You have made it so that bisexuality in the swing community is somehow different than bisexuality in other communities. Right. It's not real bisexual. We're only yeah. we're only bisexual at one weekend of the month. Right? Yeah. 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 And if you only like to do that, you know, that's fine. It is bisexual, but it's fine. You know, that's it. It's fine. It's just quit telling everybody else how they need to do it. The 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 this is where I was going with this actually. The best thing uh we can do is continue to explore and grow. And that's the best thing we can do in any facet of our life. And especially in non-monogamy is to continue to explore and grow because that's how we truly find what we like and who we are. And if we're unwilling or unable to continue to explore those things because we have repressed feelings about uh, about the community or because our partner has repressed feelings and says, no, we're not like that. We're not like those, those uh, bisexual people. Then we are, we are jumping from the monogamy box into a slightly bigger box marked swinging. But we're still in a box. And what I tell everybody they need to do is take away the box. It's the scariest possible way to do it. Yes, but it is the most fulfilling way to do it. It is the greatest opportunity for understanding yourself and your partner and those around you. Yeah. And I think one of the things, and and thank you right for, for saying that, and I think one of the things that we've really come to realize, and, and maybe we always kind of knew it, but we're really kind of putting our finger on it the last couple like year or so is that the the labels, you know, swinging poly, uh, all of the different labels that are out there are really just a conversation starter to mm -hmm. what you know. Right now, I think for us, if somebody was to, you know, not that this like happens out in the world where people are just like, "Are you swingers?" But like, <laughs> like if somebody were, I to mean, say unless that, you're putting something down <laughs> that, uh, right, right. that they're picking up. But but you know, if someone were to say like, "Well, what is your relationship dynamic?" You know. Mm -hmm. Um, it would be a conversation. It would be a conversation. It wouldn't be like, well, we're swingers or we're poly. It right. would be like, this is what we do, you know, and this is how we do it. And this is how we do it today. And, you know, maybe last year it was different. And in 2013, it was totally different because we right. didn't do anything. And so those conversations are really like the core of it. And, and yeah, you're kind of, like you said, you're throwing away the box. Right. And, yeah. and that box is swinger. It's poly. It's your sexual necessarily your sexual identity in a lot of ways and yeah and not I, being afraid to do that is is the 
is the hardest step. And like taking that leap of faith of trusting yourself that you trusting can Trusting yourself, that you can trusting do your partner. And trusting, trusting your partners, yeah. 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 And I, I also wanted to touch on the, the, the sort of the tourist analogy and that, and I don't think you meant this as a negative connotation, that there are people who they're just testing it. They don't know, right? Oh, yeah. they, they come in, they check it out. You know, it's just like you go on vacation and you go to a place and you don't know if you're going to like it. And then maybe you go back the next year and then you go back twice a year and then pretty soon you've got a condo there and then pretty soon you're retired there. <laughs> so like it's, there's, we are talking about desire, right? Cause I <laughs> yeah. would like to retire there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah, that, that tourist, like I didn't want anybody listening. Who's like, well, now I feel like a tourist to think that that was a bad thing. Cause that's no. where, that's where a lot of us start. That's where, I mean, that's where you started, right? You guys went yeah. to your first tourist dinner with another couple <laughs> because they they bullied you into it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So. But the, the the tourism part, it's like how many times do you need to have sex with this, a member of the of your same gender before you're no longer bi curious? Yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Because at some point, you really can't be considered bi curious anymore yeah. because you've you've confirmed. You know, it's 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 no longer a hypothesis. It's a thing. It's it's actually true. It's a fact. So it's no longer curious. So the same thing with the tourism thing. At some point, you've decided to get the condo here, and whether or not you want to admit it, that's that's the problem. That's yeah. that's the negative side of the tourist idea. It is, and it's, and it, and you know, some compassion there for how difficult that is, right? If, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if to admit that, to admit that, yeah. right? That you know, being bisexual or being gay or anywhere on the spectrum, the sexuality spectrum is, yeah. like it's, it is scary, right? And because a lot of times it is looked down upon, right? Well, and it's uh, so many of us have it ingrained from a very early age that that's like that's not acceptable, and so and, and sinful, and yeah. your parents would be very angry, right? Right. So yeah. pushing against that is yeah. extremely difficult. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And so. really, it's important to note that I am not uh, exceptional at any of these things. <laughs> All of this has required. Uh, I think 12 years now of of really forcing myself to understand to to analyze every aspect of my personality and my relationship styles and some of that has been extremely difficult but the difficult stuff is rewarding because you know it, it's it's like a rock tumbler. Eventually, you get a really nice rock out of it. Otherwise, it's just that pebble you found on the beach. It's not. <laughs> it's not anything exceptional. Right. And I'm not saying I'm a polished rock, but I am in the process. <laughs> yeah. And that, yeah. I think we're all trying to be in the process, right? That's yeah. the continual growth throughout your life and yeah. pushing yourself. Yeah. Um, I know you said you're like you're in queer communities now, but I could you expand a little bit on what non-monogamy looks like let's take COVID out of it what <laughs> let's just take COVID away <laughs> my general non-monogamy general, life yes. that, that had 2020 not happened the way right. it happened um my my partner and I are somewhere in between swinging and poly we have together we have been dating uh another woman for five years as of March which is wow an eternity in poly time um and we we have additional other relationships, and we still do have playmates like swinger playmates, and we still do enjoy throwing and going to parties. And I think we're going to enjoy it even more when everybody's vaccinated and we can go and do it again because I was about to throw a birthday party for myself that was going to be an awesome swing party with a new uh, new kink exploration and then covid <laughs> but the, but think of the build up yeah yeah i you know i'm not all about edging so <laughs> I, I refuse to see that as a positive especially I know a lot of people who of would it. but yeah. i yeah. don't know yeah 18 months of it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah nothing like having blue balls for 18 months huh <laughs> so i mean that's been the hardest thing about covid is that we can't we you know our our girlfriend was over here once twice a week Mm-hmm. And now, and then ever since March, we've seen her twice, three, three times, maybe, you know, it's, 
It, we we decided early on because we are both hypochondriacs that we are not going to take unnecessary risk and. You know, I know a lot of people who are seeing their extra partners. And is it a huge risk? No. Is it a risk? Yes. Right. So that's that's fine. I don't I don't uh, I don't allow for anyone deciding to go to you know Thanksgiving dinner. But seeing one other person, eh, I'm fine with that. But we we didn't. And it's been so incredibly difficult because. Like, everyone's like, oh, well, you can have a great uh, Zoom uh, relationship. It's like, no, that's worse. You know, seeing someone but not being able to touch them is infinitely harder than just pretending they're away. You know, (laughs) we're having a Victorian relationship now. We send we send missives via text, you know, and that's that it's it. I'm my my fervent hope is that um we all are able to be vaccinated by our anniversary in March and can actually get together mm-hmm. and like really get together, not just sitting across, you know, 12 feet from each other wearing masks because that's not better right, than nothing. Right. That's that's barely as good as nothing, really. Right. That's like a little bit above a Zoom call. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well but yeah that's so crossed. that's that's my uh my style i always tell people i'm non-monogamous i do like the term swinger a lot more than a lot of swingers because i think it's funny <laughs> and it it does surprise people in in that way that still happens way you know and that's fun but uh yeah i <laughs> especially after covid i'm finding it really difficult to identify with the swinger community yeah yeah, it's yeah, it's been it's been a very divisive uh, pandemic. We'll just say that. <laughs> yeah, we can just say that. <laughs> it's, it's probably the most divisive pandemic we've ever lived through. I'll say that. Oh, it is. It is the most divisive <laughs> pandemic I've ever lived through. Yeah. So so you and your ex-wife, you said going into sort of the like kind of that transition from married to not married was also sort of your transition from swinging into a little more poly and coming out of that, how did, maybe how did you evolve? And again, not saying that the evolution was from swinging to poly, but how did you change? How did you maybe grow um, over the next couple of years as you were starting to explore more? um, It made me a lot more cautious, made me a lot less willing to, um, move in a love relationship. Uh, and my, my current partner, L, she had never really been in an expansive non-monogamous relationship. And she was walking into my life as not only am I wide open, but I have very specific ideas of the way I do non-monogamy. And I probably, because of a lot of baggage from my past relationships, I was not always the best uh, uh, Sherpa through the non-monogamous world for her. Um, In the last three years or so, we've really understood how each other uh, processes non-monogamy, and we've really understood what it is. You know, we've, we've gotten to the point where there's very little worry from her that I'm not going to come home, mm-hmm. you know? And that's really it. It's, it's the fear that suddenly this, this unit you've created, this home, will be broken. And I think we're, I think we're past the fear, and that's been really good. Um, we, we tend to play separate a lot more than together and mostly it's because of uneven sex drives and that's fine because we've acknowledged that and we've understand that and that's not a failing on either of our parts. Um, but yeah, we've really found a nice equilibrium and this is (laughs) COVID is the longest I've gone without non-monogamy. So, Since 2009. <laughs> so it's a forced break, you know, that yeah. break that everyone asks, could you ever take a break? This has been forced upon me. Right. A right. break from non-monogamy. And I guess what I'm hearing, too, is that you 
you obviously didn't want this break. And <laughs> no. like during this break, it makes you like moving forward. Do you think anything's going to change like than it was before COVID? I don't know. I've been thinking about that. Like it, what does not being able to see people do to you? And I think what it has done is I think I'm going to be quicker to develop bonds with people Mm -hmm. because I'm going to be less afraid of making overtures, of taking steps, of uh, declaring interest, because who knows when another pandemic could come around, because none of us thought this could happen. You know, we all watched those movies and we're like, ah, it's not going to happen like that. Ah. But it did. And we were in our houses for almost a year now. And so if that could just happen randomly, how are we going to approach our lives? You know, and I, I, I think a lot of it remains to be seen. And a lot of it is that I want that touch that we talked about. I want that back because, you know, my partner and I cuddle, but there's still nothing like three, four, five people in that cuddle. There, there, you just, you just can't do that with two people, you know, and that's, that's rough. And so I, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping for good things. Really. We had our 1918 flu and we deserve the Roaring Twenties. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> there needs to be orgies and drugs and bacchanals. And we need to be, and fine, if there needs to be, a, we already had the stock market crash. So we already did that too. Let, let's just have the enjoyment of it all. Mm-hmm. You know, and maybe, maybe we'll be nicer to each other. I hope so. I hope, I hope that so something too. that really comes from this is is kindness. Yeah. And understanding. Because that is the most important thing of all is that, you know, the I was really struck. Uh, I read uh, Mr. Rogers' biography and the, the he made a comment that the, literally the most important thing in life is love. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's about being able to share that with people and receive that. And every everything you do is an everything positive that you do is an act of love. Every interaction with people is uh, I- positive again is an act of love. And the more of those we can do, you know, the more positive uh, and generous acts we can do, the better we'll all be. And that's why I'm so hard on a, a huge portion of the swinger community, because they have the tools. You know, we've seen it. We've seen that they have the tools. They're just not using them to be generous, to be open. They're being weirdly discriminatory. They're being weirdly selfish rather than being open and honest and communicating in the way that we all pretend our community communicates, you know, we could make this swing community what it pretends to be, which is an open and accepting uh, Valhalla. And hopefully we do, you know, and every, everybody here has that choice to make, whether or not they're going to give people the benefit of the doubt and give people the kindness and give people the love that we all so desperately crave and need in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to chime in. You brought up Mr. Rogers. And just a few days ago, I started listening to the podcast Finding Fred. Oh, it's so good. And I'm only like a couple episodes in. Oh, my God. It's so good. So good. So I just had to throw that reference or that recommendation Everybody needs to listen to that. Yeah. Yeah, You know, it's it's really funny. I have a vivid memory of my... uh, asshole 12 year old self being on a trip with my father and brother and Mr. Rogers was on and I made a, a half ass like, Oh, he's creepy. Look at him. You know, cause that's what you do when you're a dick and you're 12. <laughs> and my father like emphatically said, that is one of the kindest men in history. And that was it. 
You know, it wasn't an argument or anything like that. But I can tell you, I never again made fun of Mr. Rogers. Right. And once I actually started to learn about him, it's like, yes, he is one of the kindest and greatest men who ever was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good well, you don't expect Swinger Podcast to get into Mr. Rogers. I know, but, right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't, but it's it's the the kindness, and and yeah. I really hope that if twenty twenty has taught us anything, it it's to be kind and yeah. love love people. Yeah, and not to take things for granted, and not to take yeah. things for granted. And yeah. there's there's along along that specific line, uh, Michelle McNamara, who wrote a book called "I'll Be Gone in the Dark," Patton Oswalt's wife who died. Mm-hmm. Um, one night, Patton was asking her how she deals with all this, you know, true crime shit in her head and how she deals with the world like that. And she said uh, that it, it it's all chaos, so be kind. And so that that really informs almost every – like, I try. I, I'm, I'm not the kind of – you know, everybody who hears me say how kind I am is going to have an opinion about that. <laughs> I'm not the kindest person in the world, but I try very hard to recognize that it's chaos. Be kind. It's chaos. Be kind. Yeah. Because right now, especially it is chaos. So we need to be kind to each other. We need to, because no one else is doing it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And to be kind to ourselves. And I yes. think that's, that's another piece. That's too. the one that we, you know, maybe we struggle with the most sometimes is being kind to ourselves and Absolutely. giving ourselves a break when, you know, did we, we didn't work out enough this week or we didn't eat right this week. And you're like, well, you know what? It's been a long year and I ate 10 cookies this weekend. It's okay. <laughs> it was Christmas. <laughs> yeah. It's Emma's fault for making all the damn cookies, but I helped get rid of them. So. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, they had to go somewhere. It's a pandemic. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, all right. So now I'm curious. We've kind of gotten through, we'll say high level your story. I think we hit <laughs> We hit the, the key. We got deep on some really good places mm-hmm. and we've got yeah. some good things. Yeah. But one thing that you're very confident in is how quickly you learned... Uh, to be an expert, and <laughs> and so that that leads me oh, to believe. Oh, I sound like such a douche. <laughs> <laughs> so that leads me to believe um, that you have never had a blooper. Oh uh, God! <laughs> or a, or a misstep throughout your time navigating non-monogamy. And this is a question that we love to ask, just to show people that it's- even those of us who have been doing it forever. Uh, or maybe, you know, because you, you, a lot of times you hear people talk about it and it always sounds just like these perfect Roman orgies. And you're like, yeah, yeah but you didn't see all of the weird, hilarious bloopers, people slipping and falling and mm-hmm. all sorts of stuff happening. So we'd love to hear if you've had one or two throughout your time that, that really rise to the top. Well, I mean, first of all, I want to say that my my first book, My Life on the Swing Set, could be subtitled I Fucked Up So You Don't Have To, <laughs> because it's all about the many, many times I did stupid shit in non-monogamy. So, yes, many times. Um, I have a weird story. I, I don't have any, like, swinging, hilarious swinging stories or, or big. I have a weird story. And it was from very early on. And um, my, my ex and I used to go to this bar um, where they, it was run by lesbians. And they were, if not appreciative of the swinger crowd, tolerant of the swinger crowd. Because the swingers would show up there every week and drink for hours and then then go off and and have shenanigans not at the bar uh, outside the bar <laughs> and there was this couple there that we were interacting with over a few weeks and um finally you know there was there was a little connection a little spark and it was about i want to say 11:30 and this is a weeknight and uh, the the wife of this couple says, hey, uh, you want to come back to our place? And we're like, eh, sure, yeah, yeah, that's, that sounds like fun. And so we're, we're leaving the bar, and um, she pulls my wife over and says, hey, can our friend come? Trust me, it's worth it. 
<laughs> and it's like I, I look over and there's this guy just kind of standing, you know, in maybe fifties, just nothing, nothing uh, exceptional, nothing bad though. And and my wife's just a people pleaser. Like, and okay, I'm just gonna okay. I'm gonna interrupt you really quick, Coop, because the vision I got, the image I got, was the smoking man from the X Files. <laughs> Just, just this creepy guy like over in the corner, just smoking, and you're like, I don't know. No, I, I think I would have objected. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was, he was, he was in no way creepy, but in no way stood out. Okay, let's just put it that way. So, we start driving, and like literally 45 minutes have gone by, and we're not there yet. And <laughs> they live in the complete opposite direction of our house, which is 45 minutes from the bar. <laughs> so we're already an hour and a half away. And this is and like 11 now. After yeah, no, midnight we're, we're after midnight on a weeknight. We both have to work in the morning. Uh, so we get to their house finally and we, we sneak in because they have a babysitter and they don't want the babysitter to know they had people come home with them. Yeah, we've never done uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> So we're we're all hanging out in their bedroom. The babysitter's gone home. And um the the wife starts getting very amorous with extra guy. And I'm I'm just sort of paying attention here, okay, because uh husband is sitting on the corner of the king size bed. Husband's in far corner of the king size bed on the opposite side of wife and my wife and this guy. And I, I'm just looking at him. It's like, okay, I'm, I've learned at this point, this is still very early on. So I've learned that often in swing uh, situations, things get started in small clusters of the group and then move to the rest of the group. So I'm fine with that. I'm not, I'm no longer overly concerned about it. And, then uh extra guy uh reveals himself and basically I, I still have it in my memory as he unfurled his penis <laughs> because it had to have unrolled with you know it was like that moment in Beetlejuice where he where he throws down the the hammers and they inflate. So he unfurled his, his, and it is literally, like, without hyperbole, the largest penis I have ever seen in my life, and that still holds true today, <laughs> including porn, the largest. And it's like, okay, well, well, that explains the he's worth it part. <laughs> so um, my, my wife and the other wife are going to town on this guy. And, you know, there's plenty of real estate to work. I was going to say there's probably room for a yeah. few more. No, I mean, there, there's, there's plenty of room. But then I notice uh, that husband is over here and he doesn't look like cuckold enjoying himself. He looks like sad enjoying himself. No, no, not enjoying himself. Right. Not sad, enjoying. He looks like he's not having a good time. He he's he's glancing away. He looks uncomfortable. But you know, it's still again very early on in swinging. I'm trying very hard not to judge other people's dynamics. Also, I really like the idea that I might get laid tonight. So I'm willing to go along with certain things at this point, and that's part of me being a fuck up right there. I shouldn't have gone along with. Certain things. Okay, so husband gets naked. Uh, extra guy unloads all over uh, the women. Great. Um, I noticed that, that the husband, and this is no shame, has literally the smallest penis that I have ever seen in my life. And so I see what their dynamic is now. I get it. And it's terrifying. But again, I still, you know, I'm I'm hoping that sexy time comes tonight. And then I see uh the the wife over here who's very drunk try to go down on my wife while her face is literally covered in this guy's cum. And this was even before I was all oral barriers and bullets. It's like, whoa, let's redirect you away from there. Yeah. Dear God, that's that's just a, that's a whole problem waiting to happen there. And uh, it was about that time I realized that maybe this was not a great, uh, great idea to be part of this, whatever the fuck this dynamic is here. Uh, and we got out of there shortly later, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was not, 
It was not a great experience. Well, at least you didn't stick around till like six a.m. It might have been like oh, no, three a.m. No, 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 no. We we were we were home by three. I want to say okay. We yeah. did not spend too much time there. <laughs> yeah, I think what's what's hard to convey to people. You know, maybe there's somebody brand new who's never done anything like this, like. And we've not necessarily done that exact thing, um, but <laughs> no, you haven't Just, been with giant dick and small dick guy. Because like you don't expect to see both sides of the spectrum on either end right. of a bed, right. right? Right. No, for sure. But I think just the way that these memories get like etched into your brain, and they're just, oh, yeah. and and then you only get to share them cer- certain times. They're not appropriate for every. Dinner no. conversation, but but once in a while you get to roll them out and they're they're just a, and they all come just flooding back gem. to you. Yeah, and I I mean I'm sad there's not a big punchline at the end of that one. It's just well that was awkward. You yeah, know, that, I mean, it's, there there there's a lot of that. Well, that was awkward. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. We've had many many of those, <laughs> and typically, so the thing you did better than us is you left fairly fr- fairly quickly. <laughs> well, we we're the type who's like, well, maybe it'll get better. We'll hang around, see if this improves, and then, um, yeah, that was us. I mean, you know. okay, to to uh, to dissuade the the gold star you've given me, I did fuck the drunk wife. <laughs> so you didn't just leave, okay? No, so I wasn't that good a guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad we pushed you on that. Yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> That's okay. That's the punchline, Cooper. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, that was that was right about the time when I realized maybe drunk people are not as much fun as they seem to be. Yeah. yeah. And now again, no no shame, no judgment, but did you offer her a washcloth before you fucked her or did you just well, once I'd redirected her, she she wound up going back to the other guy, and, and so so it was it was no longer my problem at that point. So by the time she came back to you, it was dried and it was yes, fine. yes, she would she had she had well because the other guy was not about to kiss her with his cum all over her face. I got because you. he was that guy. So she she had to clean off first. Okay, you know? yeah. all right. Well, we've painted the, we've painted a very vivid picture. This was no listening. longer my problem, really. That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah, no longer my concern. yeah that was uh, a very vivid picture we painted. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. And it, I will say, and I, we just keep going on tangents. But it made me think when you were talking about driving for 45 minutes. It made me think of the Jim Gaffigan bit where he's like. Yeah, I'm from Chicago. Oh, where? Where in Chicago? Oh, oh, yes. Outside Chicago. Oh, where outside Chicago? Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, so you wound up in Milwaukee for this event. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, well I was going to say, well, it's been wonderful talking to you. And we wanted to give you the chance, too, to plug any of yeah. your work that you wanted to. Um, we'd love, actually... We have that. Oh, look at that. You have an original edition, too. We have an original edition here of My Life wow. on the Swing Set. Um, your book, I don't remember what year this is. Designed. Was. And it's, it's signed. 2015. Yeah, I yeah. wrote a bunch of stuff there, you didn't did. I? You wow. did. Yeah, from 2015. So um, I just I had forgotten about it, but it was under our bed with a few other things. <laughs> Of I mean, all random places. No, honestly, a book under the bed, that's good company to be in because only the best books wind up under the bed. Right, exactly. Because yeah. <laughs> most books aren't even brought into the bedroom. So you know, there's that. Well, when your apartment is a bedroom, everything <laughs> well, that everything's yeah. in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> So lately, I've been uh, I've been switching gears a little bit. I've written two horror novels, and I'm really proud of those. And I just had one come out on audiobook. Uh, they are the Spectral Inspector novels, so you can find those at spectralinspector.com. And they'll be in the show notes, so people don't need to frantically write. So awesome. we, got you, we got your back. I also. Um, I also started another podcast that's completely a field of this called The Pike Cast, which is about uh, Christopher Pike, the teen horror author from the 90s. So, you know, again, completely a field of this, but I don't censor myself on that podcast either. So, you know, there's that. Um, 
If you want to get into my swinging content, I have a really good deal going on, and you got to get it quickly. But if you go to cooperspeckett.com slash bundle, for $25, you can get all three of my swinging books as ebooks and audiobooks. Wow. So pretty good slash bundle. Otherwise, um, my life on the swing set is my memoir. Uh, it's my first five years of swinging. So you may hear some of these same stories that I just said on this podcast in there. Um, a life less monogamous and approaching the swingularity are my novels about non monogamy. Uh, approaching the swingularity is the most uh, graphically sexual thing I've ever written. So if you're looking for more erotica, go with that one because the first one uh, does not have as much uh, exciting, sexy sex in it. And I'm about to start work with Ginger Bentham, my co-host from Life on the Swing Set, on a new book, a, a new nonfiction book about opening your relationship and exploring both swinging and polyamory. Uh, so we're very excited to begin working on that. But also, the Swing Set Takes Desire, swingsettakesdesire.com, will be back in 2021, uh, assuming nothing horrible happens between now and November. So you should come with us to Desire Resort because it's the most amazing place in the world. And we, uh, our trip invites, uh, gay couples, trans people, like every, every member of the sexual spectrum, every member of the relationship spectrum, wherever you are, we welcome you. Uh, so yeah, you should come. And we can, and we can vouch for that last one because we've been, Three times. We have been yeah. three times. We even flew from Bolivia <laughs> to be there the last time we went. We so did. We, we did. My, my. So we, yeah, we, uh, we can, uh, we can attest to that. So thank you. Cooper, well, yeah, for it's, treating just, all it's always been an amazing, inclusive week. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and thank you for all the other work you do too. Absolutely. Well. Are there any final words of wisdom you want to leave with the people who listen to us on the road? I wish I'd saved that be kind part but no i mean <laughs> honestly that's what we all need to do we just need to be accepting we need to be open we need to be friendly and we need to we need to stop only focusing on whether things affect us personally yeah because things that affect our community things that affect our friends things that affect friends of friends of friends they will ultimately come around and affect us. So if you want a selfish reason to be nice to people, ultimately every negative thing you do will come around in some, not karmic because I don't believe in that, in some way back to you. So just be fucking nice to people. And and if, we, if this is still important, wear a fucking mask. <laughs> Indeed, yes. yes. We're, we're recording uh, on December twenty eighth, so who knows what the world will look like when this comes out? But when we find out where uh, uh, how bad it is uh, for all the people who went home for Christmas and yeah. who party for New Year's, thankfully nothing happens in January. So you know, maybe we'll get through this. Yeah, we, yeah let's we hope, hope so. so. But yes, please wear a mask. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and as always, thank you, Cooper. We're we're happy to finally get you on the show, and My you pleasure. are always welcome back whenever, uh, whenever you want. Yes, well, I'd love so to much. come back. So we can talk middle era rather than origin stories. Right? Yeah, we got we got like the origin, and then we just like light speed past. And then today, <laughs> today we did. But we just, you know what? The, we went through ten years real fast. <laughs> we're like that behind the music part where they don't really want to focus on the good years because the good years are boring, you know. So we got to get to the point where, and then the band broke up. <laughs> <laughs> and well, this this version is and then COVID. <laughs> yeah, and then COVID. Yeah, fuck. Well, well, we'll bring you back for the middle years, the boring years, as we'll call them. And <laughs> You're really reeling people in here. Yeah, yeah don't call them that in the title. <laughs> no, 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 no. But awesome. Well, thank you again, and have a have a wonderful evening. Yeah, you thank too. you. Stay safe. And we're back. 
Thank you so much, Cooper, for coming on the show and sharing all of your story that you did. It was amazing to talk to you. And, and for all the work you've done exactly. in the community, kind of blazing blazing a lot of trails out there. So thank you uh, for that. I especially love that we touched on Mr. Rogers in this episode. Yeah. And, <laughs> and since this uh, recorded, I've actually been listening to the, we the both have. Finding Fred podcast. Mm-hmm. So uh, highly recommend it if you're uh, needing a break from your non-monogamy podcast. Although maybe, maybe Mr. Rogers gets there. I don't know. <laughs> We I'm, haven't I'm, finished. Only, I'm only about halfway through. I know, I don't we haven't know, finished the series yet. I don't know yet. how it ends. So. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. We also wanted to take a minute here to thank all of our Patreon members. And we have an amazing community there. And it would not be possible without all of you who joined. So thank you so much for joining and contributing and being part of our community. If you're unfamiliar with Patreon, it's a way that you can support the show and join our community at different levels. You get access to our monthly Q&As. Our next one is February 24th. We do one at 9 p.m. Eastern and one at 9 p.m. Pacific. These turn into pretty informal discussions and really are a really supportive group. We love doing the Q&As. Uh, we also have a MeWe chat group with everyone in, in the chat group just talking and supporting each other and we have men's and women's groups as well. So please go check that out. Uh, you can go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com and click on the Patreon button. Yeah, and then just to kind of build on what Emma was saying, like if, if you are out there looking for people in this community or maybe you're brand new and you don't even know where to begin, like this community has been a really great place for people to come in and ask questions and meet other people who are just exploring it themselves or figuring it out and everybody's just super supportive and yeah it's been a really kind of a great help for both of us coming you know going through the isolation of covid and everything like that and so i don't know we've we've had a lot of people in there who've said that it's kind of been their lifeline Mm -hmm. (laughs) for the last year and a half and um so yeah we just we love we'd love to have you check it out if it's not for you you don't have to stick around it's no no hard feelings and Uh, Yeah, hopefully we'll see you there. We'll see you at the next Q&A, perhaps, or in the MeWe group. And a really quick reminder, meet and greet this Saturday. Open to everyone, $10. Go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the meet and greet tab and sign up. And next week, we have our interview with Alice and Sam. Yeah, a fantastic interview. As Uh, always. As always. (laughs) We actually had the privilege of going hiking with them last weekend. Yeah, we did. So uh, we we mashed up, socially distanced, and went for a nice hike outside on on Valentine's Day. We did. It was awesome. Which was interesting. (laughs) Because we don't usually celebrate Valentine's Day. We don't. I don't know if this counts as celebrating it. This was just hiking. This was just going for a hike with friends. Yeah. I don't know why I said it was interesting. Well, it was interesting. Anyway. Should I stop talking? Yes. (laughs) think you should stop talking we had a great time you should come back and listen to their episode next week we'll see you then bye everyone thanks for listening thanks for listening to me ramble on <laughs> is, what, is that what you're trying to say i was trying to wrap it up <laughs> <laughs> you just keep talking i know <laughs> <laughs>